Good afternoon and welcome. We're super excited to have you here this uh, afternoon to talk to us about enabling your mission through automatic alignment with NIST risk management framework. But it could be any framework, right? It doesn't have to be RMF. It could be a custom framework or multiple frameworks. But see, I think it'd be really interesting understanding who's out there first. Absolutely. So quick show of hands. Who here cares about security and want to be able to remediate threats in near real time? All right. You got I would expect group. so. This is the group. Good choice. Good choice. Now, a uh, second question that I have, and it's not an or, it could be an and, is who here cares about compliance, now with respect to a single point in time, like right after an audit, but leveraging and harnessing that awesome data you're pulling into Splunk to understand your compliance posture 24-7. Okay? See most of the hands coming up? Still awesome. in the right place. Right place. Now, uh, I think we're going to have enough time for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions that come to mind, please jot them down so you don't forget. Worst case, we're going to be outside afterwards. In addition, we also have booths in the pavilion. A little bit of legalese. You've probably seen this a couple dozen times by now. It is Wednesday after all. So who am I? Well, Steve introduced me. My name is Rutger. I'm the Director of Technical Engagements for Chemos. People that don't know who we are yet, we're located in the Washington, D.C. area, spring distance from the National Mall. Now, I've been doing consulting for the past 13 years, working with a plethora of tools. Past five years, focusing on Splunk, having a blast doing so, by the way, and the last three of which focusing mostly on Splunk Professional Services. Now, this is my fourth comp. And you probably recognize me hanging out here with Mechanical Buttercup. It was trotting around here on-prem two years ago in Orlando. I haven't seen it this year, but I've seen a larger Buttercup hanging around. So that's me, my illustrious co-presenter. Thank you. Uh, Steve Vetter, I'm with Cisco. Been there for two years, 15 years in the industry with EDS, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, kind of a services bent from that standpoint. Retired Navy Intel, so I'm going to give you a perspective in terms of threat driven by what we know of our adversaries and how quickly they evolve and morph. And most importantly, I'm a comp virgin, so be gentle with me. And I'm going to let you keep punching through, dude. Brecker, I'm going to let you punch. Thank you, and that's the first step there. So, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? First of all, we want to start to talk about in terms of the foundation, how fundamentally our transformative driver is going to be impacting what's being done. So we're going to walk through some stuff related to devices and explosion of the data and the devices around them. Second, we're going to talk about the next thing in terms of how do you do mission enablement to ensure that your data and security frameworks actually are pragmatic in the approach. The number of times I've been talking to senior leaders within the federal government, within a variety of other organizations, and they say, I need sane IT. I need to accomplish my mission. We talk about shadow IT sometimes in terms of IT people. They don't see it that way. It's mission IT. IT needs to be enabled for the mission. We need to make sure that we have a synergy of those capabilities. And that fundamentally is what we're going to be talking about. Pragmatic mission accomplishment that is enabled by security and the automation and machine learning capabilities that are being delivered through new technologies. And we're going to need that in order to blunt the adversaries and the capabilities that they have. So the actionable insights that we're going to get not only are actionable from the standpoint of how and what do I need to do, but I'm going to automate them, and I'm going to automate them in a way that assures compliance, because I need compliance for most people to feel comfortable with the steps that we're taking moving forward. And as I said, machine learning is that game change, both in security as well as from an automation standpoint. And finally, the outcome then that Rutgers is going to walk you through is how that framework aligns to the mission. And most importantly, how do you make sure that you have the compliance reporting and tracking, which is that security blanket that enables our leadership to feel comfortable that, in fact, I am accomplishing something of value and, and we get it back to the mission outcome or the business outcome that we're trying to accomplish. Sounds good? Okay, next. So the foundation. 
Transformative drivers are already here, next slide. And at the end of the day, it's about the explosion of things that are going on. Last year, we had 20 billion devices and sensors. By two years from now, at least 30 billion. And some are calling by 2025 somewhere between 50 and 200 billion devices and sensors on the network. There is no stopping this. It's coming everywhere we see. We have to figure out how to out of that reality that forces us to take action, even though we may, we may be comfortable doing that. Likewise, if you have that amount of sensors and data, you're producing an explosion of data. 90% of the data in this world was created in the last two years. 90% in the last two years, and we're adding more devices to it. So the amount of data is overwhelming, which means you can't suck in all of that data in terms of something that's based on a model that's says I pay for every bit of data, but I need to understand that data in a way that enables me to understand what's important and how to take those components going forward. And that is how industry is going to evolve, and we're going to give you a glimpse of what that means right now and something that we've actually done in that environment. And then, if you haven't bought into it at this point, if you're a really believer in the World Economic Forum uh, at Davos from about five years ago, they talked about the fourth industrial revolution and physical cyber devices, we're already seeing them. Whether you're an emergency vehicle in a smart city that's trying to time its street lights as it goes through in order to automate and quickly uh, streamline where it's going to their emergency, or whether it's something in an emergency room or an Alzheimer's patient whose treatment is being done and modified on the fly in reaction to the environmentals that are around, or whether it's my personal favorite, the network with machine learning that enables you to understand what's going on on that network, and then based upon what you're seeing, dynamically have that network evolve so that it accomplishes what you want. And think about what that could mean for the adversary who has a network that they've scoped out, all of a sudden is different than what they thought. So there is some tremendous potential here in terms of what we're doing and we're going to walk through all of that. And then when you marry all of that to the cloud and containers and those evolutions, at the end it keeps coming back to those sensors frequently are going to be at the edge. I would say the edge is going to eat the cloud for lunch. Big data needs to get back to the cloud for the insights that you're going to generate. But the actions, in many cases, are going to be at the edge. Whether you are an autonomous vehicle, where you need to have immediate reaction so that you don't have an accident, you're not going to the cloud. Whether it's augmented reality, virtual reality, no time to get to the cloud, because your brain and mind will not be able to tolerate the millisecond or the microsecond journey from terms of where it's going. And that is critical to how we are thinking going forward. Next. Now, if that weren't bad enough with all of that change, our adversaries have taken advantage of that. And you've all heard, but let me give it to you kind of authoritatively from that standpoint, the need and expectation in our businesses and in our, in our governments to be able to collaborate, to be able to coordinate, to be able to exchange information in order to approve and enhance our business and mission outcomes has never been greater. So we're not going backwards. We're going to keep doing it. The adversaries then have all of those increased surfaces to be able to come after us. And if that weren't difficult enough, we have folks like shadow brokers who basically hack and steal things from other things. And NSA has these great tools. So let's give those tools to people who may not have been able to do that on their own and empower them with new capabilities from that point. So you've got all these new surfaces, and you've got great new tools that we put in the hands of the hackers to be able to do that, which is the dynamic, rapidly evolving nature of the threat because they're taking advantage of them, and we need to be able to counterpunch. So what do we do to do that? We need real-time visibility across the entire network and supporting infrastructure, and that means the data and the applications that ride on top of them. It also is real-time enforcement of those policies. When we see something of abnormal or anomalous activity that we know to be bad, whatever your policies are, you set that. And then finally, the ability to dynamically change the network in response to that behavior, which is really the core of what a lot of people are talking about in terms of zero trust. And that zero trust foundation goes all the way from layer two to layer seven. And so when software-defined networking came around and we focused on layer three through seven, important, but I got to get down to that physical layer to be able to react so that I'm not changing just a VLAN, I'm changing the actual device and locking that single device out because I can't afford to bring down the entire VLAN, the entire network from that standpoint. I need to be able to segment to an application, to a device, to a port, to a user. And that's why micro-segmentation is going to be critical for the future, and it's going to be critical based upon getting access to layer two through seven. Record. Awesome, Steve. So now we understand the foundation, we understand the why. Next we're going to talk about the how, so the means. First and foremost, what we found is 
that no team can do it alone. And it, it really, what we found is that Splunk, Cisco, and Cumulus coming together provided that solution that where we're able to come together harmoniously to help address your security and compliance needs. Now, each one provides a third of the equation. Now, Cisco provides that raw data, that intelligence, and the arsenal to remediate the threats in your environment. Splunk, as you, I'm sure, are well uh, aware of, provides that place of aggregation of all that amazing machine data, so you can then perform analytics on it. On top of Splunk, you have Q Compliance by Q that then goes ahead and contextualizes, visualizes, reports, provides that dashboarding and alerting. You take all of that and you wrap it neatly in some intelligence, intelligent automation and you have a killer solution. Now I'm gonna give you guys a second to read this cartoon up here. Exactly. You, it's kind of funny. You can't spell compliance without lines. So there's some truth to that, right, right? Where compliance is sometimes fudged for one reason or another, but typically it's done so unintentionally. But how do we address that? Well, you have evidence on your network. So how about we feed that into Splunk and now leverage that because it doesn't lie, but how much does it really help if you don't leverage that information and then take action on it? Now, we're going to be coming back to that a little bit later, but that's something to uh, make a mental note about. So, Steve, for those that are less familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework, would you please give them Absolutely. a refresher? Give me the next punch, if you would. Yes, of course. So as Rutgers said, we're really talking about a framework, right? And that framework has to have a certain number of characteristics. Congress decided to tell NIST exactly what they wanted to do, and these are the characteristics associated. It's got to be flexible. It's got to be repeatable. You've got to have it performance-based. It certainly has to be cost-effective moving forward, and you've got to be able to prioritize with your organization on things that you need to do. But the goal at the end of the day for every framework Identify, assess, and manage those cyber risks. So at the end of the day, next punch, we're able to take a look at it from the standpoint of the framework, three parts, pretty much all of them will have it. You'll talk about identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. I'm sure you've all seen these colors. You're, you are know, seen them frequently. And that's the core. These are the functions that you need to do. But it's not a vanilla perspective at that point. Next. So at the end of the day, there are two important additions to that, the two, next two parts. Four maturity tiers, whether they're four or ten or whatever, addressing where you are as an organization and the level of maturity and focus that you have is absolutely essential because it is critical to align to your business requirements. And it's your business requirements, your tolerance for risk, and the ability to have organizational resources be brought to bear that are going to help you find where you are on that maturity profile, and then more importantly, develop your own specific organizational profile. And the capabilities we're demonstrating today can be flexible enough to adapt to any of the profiles that you have. NIST has to be a common one in the federal government that they're adapting, but there are many more out there, but they all have these same characteristics, business requirements, risk tolerance, and your own profile based upon what you need to protect and what your level of tolerance for risk is, because remember, it's the risk management framework. NASA, for example, has tolerance for risk because they're used to putting people on rockets and launching them up, and those rockets can blow up, and they manage that risk because they know the mission and they know what are the tolerances that they are able to do in order to be successful as they do that. The same way in security, the goal of security is not to inflict a self-inflicted denial of service attack on your own network because you've made it so difficult, but rather it is to help the mission be enabled, whether it's a business or a government organization, to accomplish what they're trying to do. And the beautiful thing about this is it doesn't matter whether you're information technology, operational technology, facility-related control systems, your cyber physical systems, OT, all of these things need the same construct and these 
philosophies, these approaches apply to all of them. So the solution that you create for a medical wireless infusion pump can apply to an HVAC system, can apply to a piece of critical infrastructure associated with the SCADA system as they connect into that environment if you lay out that framework correctly and move forward. And we're going to jump on this probably 14 times, slight exaggeration. It's flexible. It is not a checklist because so often people like a checklist and I'm then secure. If you have that mentality, I have checked the boxes of this framework and therefore I am secure, you've just given your network to the, or to the adversary because they are thinking and evolving from that point of view. They are looking for the threat surfaces and there are vulnerabilities that need to be in place. From my old naval intelligence days, it's like we had an inbound missile. The goal was to shoot it down. We didn't have the ability to shoot it down necessarily in some cases, so we would try to actively jam it. If we couldn't actively jam it, we would passively jam it, make them think the carrier's over here, so the missile deflects and goes that direction. Soviets were smart. They figured out, we figured out how to beat them on that. So they came up with a countermeasure to our electronic countermeasure. And all of a sudden, we had to come back and come up with a countermeasure to their countermeasure to our countermeasure. And that's the game that we're in. Whether you call that cat and mouse, whether it's continuing to evolve, it is nothing you never rest at. And why is that important? Because it means you all have job security. And they're going to be need more and more of you from that standpoint, and you need tools like this to be more effective in the direction that's going. So as you take a look at it, it becomes operationalized to make that real. In intelligence, we produce data, but the goal is always to operationalize that in order to produce real-time actions that the operators then take in order to accomplish the mission. Nothing is different here. And the risk management framework is a framework designed to help you think through that process, put in place the controls that are critical to your organization, and then be able to take those controls and ensure that they are accomplishing and supporting the mission of the organization, whether that's a business or whether that's a federal agency or a state and local government. Exactly, and well said, Steve. So how do we take Splunk's capabilities to the next level? Well, we want automation not just to alert, but have it automatically resolve performance and security issues. Now you have real-time actions to ensure performance, availability, and most importantly, security. And Steve, how do we uh, employ these strategies? So micro-segmentation of the network. I'm, it's a love of mine. Don't ask me why. I'm strange. I know that as you probably already did. But at the same time, real-time responses to the dynamic security threat, and that means that you're looking for anomalous activity, you're looking for capabilities that an adversary has in evolving. Most importantly, you need global threat intelligence, so you're not trying to do it on your own within your organization. What's going on to take advantage of those capabilities? And what that means is, next punch, we've got the ability to have actionable insights then, but you still need to take action on them. And that's why one tool alone is probably insufficient. You need to, how do I bring together a team, as Rucker said, to be able to solve this problem, to be able to address it effectively. And that's what we're going to talk about from here on out. Next. Exactly. And I uh, totally agree, Steve. Uh, actionable insights still require action. I think that should probably be the mantra of the day. So if there's anything that you take away from this talk is that. And we'll come back to that again uh, here shortly. So how do we do that? Everybody's familiar with networks, right? And so you worry about performance. That's what everyone has been worried about for the last decade. Next. But you also have to worry about scale, especially in the federal government. How do I scale to an organization the size of the IRS, or the size of the Postal Service, or the size of you name it? And at the end of the day, it's that scale that has to be taken into account with performance. And if it were that easy, OK, that would be cool. But you've got to have security in there as well. And then the trifecta is performance with scale and security tied together. And fortunately, we have a couple of things in our quiver. The first one is automation that comes from machine learning and what that means. And those are the game change. We're going to talk about it in a minute, Gartner, intent-based networking. And the ability then to derive savings and consolidation of the network, which enables enhanced security from that point of view. And we're going to walk you through those details here kind of quickly. But to give you a feel for, we are at a point in time that we have an advantage that's going to our area, and if we are there to embrace it, I think we have a chance to kind of do a game change for protecting our nation's critical infrastructure as well as the infrastructure within our own organizations. What does Steve mean? These game changers are going to enable both mission and security, and I'll walk you through the details. Next. So at the end of the day, Gartner in February of 17 came out with something called intent-based networking. Cisco released our version of that in the summer of 17, and it basically is really simple. Machine learning that takes your intent. I do not want a BYOD device to connect to HR data. 
pretty clear intent. The machine can now take that and automatically configure the policies necessary to do that, which streamlines and enhances the ability of the network to do that. And it then allows you to automatically provision that, which means your ability to provision rapidly, i.e. change the network quickly in response to evolving and dy dynamic threats, is there. But the most important piece that is sometimes left out is that last one on the right, and that is the assurance that the network is doing what it was told to do. No one is going to trust the network with machine learning unless you can validate that the network is doing what you told it to do. And that is fundamental to one of the issues that gives us a chance for success on security as well. Next. Because at the end of the day, as you make the journey toward intent-based networking, and Gartner said by 2020, there'll be 1,000 enterprise clients up and running by that. That's actually going to be well in advance of that because it is so powerful from the things that are being done, how much capability it delivers. And this is the journey that you're on. A lot of our clients are up in the machine learning and AI bringing that in. But the steps, whether it is the infrastructure, policy-based automation, the analytics insurance, are all parts of that journey that would then go into your framework to say, where am I on my maturity level? But if you're thinking about this and you know the end state, which is the intent-based networking construct that the machine, that the network, can self-heal, can self-protect, then all of a sudden you know the direction we're going and it needs the bright people in this room to be able to help the government, help individual organizations and agencies and companies to be able to move in that direction. Next, and it all goes to scale in terms of what needs to be done. And there are different solutions, different components when you think about that scale. Next. So at the end of the day, the reason, and don't punch forward because this is my favorite slide, <laughs> if you start right here, then this is what most people have done for the last two decades. Certainly when software-defined networking came around, the construct was, I need to manage performance. Therefore, I can look at every 20th or 50th packet, and I'm good. And that was true. I can manage performance of a network looking at every 50th packet. What's the problem with that? If there's something bad in those other 19 or 49 packets, I'm hosed. I need to be able to see everything associated with that from a security standpoint to make sure that the network is doing what it is told to do and that it is protected from the things going forward. Because otherwise, now you can punch, there are nasty guys out there that are trying to get things in, especially in encrypted malware, et cetera, that are going to be driving that area. So while full net flow visibility gives you the ability to have performance and capability for assurance, and you can sample it and get network performance, what you can't get is security from that point of view. So what does that mean? What is the power of what we just talked about? Next slide. And as you take a look at it, something we call encrypted traffic analytics, the ability of the network to look at malware in its encrypted state without having a man in the middle decrypting it and be able to detect that malware. That's magic, Steve. You can't do that. Well, in point of fact, yes, we can. And it continues to evolve. But at the end of the day, you've got your unclassified packet header, unencrypted packet header. And as we all know, with the release of TLS.1.3, it's getting smaller. There's less data available now, which already challenges man in the middle and deep packet inspection of the encrypted packet as it's decrypted. Now you start to take a look at the characteristics of what an adversary does, which is different than what most people do in the rest of the packets. It's amplitude, it's concentration, it's duration. All of those are different. And if you marry that with threat intelligence, like 600 billion emails a day, and look at the, the variations and differences associated with that, then you can fundamentally begin to say, wow, I don't think that's possible, but I think I've got something unusual here. What can I do? And you now take 5,000 algorithms that are looking at the network and what performance has been, and you get to that stage. I'm, a doubt, I'm from Missouri, kind of from that way, technically Minnesota, but that's close to Missouri. And so I don't believe most of the things I say. I've worked for previous companies where they would tell me something was ready to go, didn't believe it. Anyway, so took it to an independent lab called Mircom. In March, they did a complete assessment of that. And within three hours of all of the malware, both known and unknown, it had detected 100% of the malware. And I still didn't believe it, because I'm, again, doubting Thomas. And so I went to who I respect most in the federal government, the guy who's leading the architecture for government cybersecurity architecture review, who actually happened to work at one point for a uh, competitor of Mircom. And he looked at the way they laid out the test, and he said, this is real. He goes, this is exactly how I would have done it. And so we have capabilities now that are on the vanguard of what technology is enabling us to do that if we start to think about those capabilities and we put that in a framework, whether it's NIST or your own, that enable us to understand what those capabilities are and bring those new tools into our arsenal, we have a chance to do something that we haven't had a chance for a long time, which is to take back the high ground from our adversaries. Next. So quick takeaways before we get into the details of it. We've already talked about 
Next generation of IT, it's unstoppable. We've got more devices coming at us, more data than you've ever seen. The nice thing is it's applicable to all of those edge devices, IT, IIoT, OT, doesn't matter. The threat's evolving, dynamic, evolving. The technological advances can be our ally in addition to an adversary from that standpoint, and there's an overwhelming amount of data associated with that. So punch one more. At the end of the day, we can take, as I said, the high ground back from our adversaries. Pretty cool, right? Right? Okay, just making sure. Now, how do we do that though? How are we gonna do that and what is the optimal way for Splunk and a solution to do that? And what role does automation play? And for that, you're not gonna listen to me. Back to Rucker. Thanks again, Steve. So we talked about the why, Steve talked about the how, now we're gonna talk about how we employ those strategies to improve compliance and your security posture. We already talked about how it takes a team, that no one company can do it alone. So I'm gonna show you how the pieces came together to provide a comprehensive solution to give you real-time insight into your compliance posture and bring security to the next level. So we came together with Red River a systems integrator with Splunk, Cisco, and Cumulos to provide a solution to meet the compliance and security needs of a medical provider. As mentioned, they adopted the trifecta and they wanted and challenged us to automatically identify, classify, secure assets connected to the network. In addition, they want to dynamically change the security controls based on vulnerabilities and threats. So what's that mean? Well, you have this, the raw data, right, coming into Splunk, looking at the technical evidence provided through the raw data, and then making a decision based on that. Do I pass or do I fail that control? Right, so that's a piece of the equation there. Why, why do we do all this? Well, ultimately, we want to stop complex threats faster. The environment that we worked with is displayed here in this uh, graphic, very high level. This is not a network diagram. But uh, Steve, for those that are less familiar with Cisco's suite of tools, could you touch on Firepower, ICE, and Southwatch a little bit? Happy to. So not only can one company not do it all, one product can't do it all. Anybody that tells you it can, you got snake oil going on. At the end of the day, Cisco uses our identity services engine as a means to control the network. What's on the network, manages the network, powers the network, controls the policies that go into place on the network. It's the enforcement arm of the things that need to be done in that area. But if all you're doing is looking at the network and what's going on, how do you detect anomalous activity from that standpoint? Lots of companies are trying to develop this. We have something called StealthWatch, which has been mature for about two and a half years already. And what it does is it detects anomalous activity in real time and then allows policies to be put in place via ICE onto the network. What do you mean it's real, Steve? Give me an example. Happy to, glad you asked. Go back to the Rio Olympics in 2016. 60 tons of Cisco gear drops onto Rio. Not literally, but kind of. So that gear then provides capability for the entire Rio Olympics. 2.1 petabytes of data over a 16 day period. And the other thing they did was they turned to us for security as well. So Stealth Watch and ICE went into play as well. There were 180,000 use over those 60 days, or 16 days. 90% mobile. Most of those mobile users were BYOD. Trojans, malware, everywhere. That is a horrifying scenario for most organizations. 180,000 users in 16 days coming onto a network with BYOD everywhere. How many security incidents? Yes. Zero. Zero security incidents when you have an integrated network and security overlay from that standpoint. And part of that was the ability to have firewalls in place, next generation firewalls to take feeds from other data threat scenario environments and be able to do that to force compliance on the network environment going forward. One tool doesn't do it, it's an ecosystem of tools. A lot of your solutions in the framework will be what have you already invested in? What already works for you? Because at the end of the day, if you don't have this, and whether it's what we call PX Grid, an XMPP based protocol, it's gotta be open, it's gotta be extensible. It's gotta work with others. The ability for us to work with Splunk with already native integrations, or ServiceNow, or Cumulus, is a fundamental premise going forward, and if your partners aren't doing that, 
then you should be looking for new partners. It has to interoperate and work with others. Because with those three pieces, then what do we do? Exactly, Steve. So what do we do? We take all that amazing machine data, we funnel it into Splunk, we perform analytics, and as mentioned earlier, you have Cumulus Q compliance sitting on top of Splunk to provide that contextualization, that correlation, the mapping of that technical evidence to controls with respect to your framework or frameworks, whether you're prescribing to one of the many NIST-based frameworks or custom one, right? There's customers that have custom developed uh, solutions. So one thing that I'd like to point out is that to protect the innocent, we have some screenshots coming up, but they were, they're from a lab environment, but it demonstrates what we implemented. Coming up in the next slides, I'll also talk about how we identify the assets, how we go about monitoring those assets, alert, and then ultimately trigger some automations. So step one, asset discovery, right? Because in order to meet uh, information system component inventory, uh, control CM08, we have to understand our threat landscape, right? So that's pretty important. Not only hosts are important, but appliances, right? Appliances are critical where upgrades are not an option, such as medical wireless infusion pump, right? It's kind of hard upgrading that. So how do we deal with it? Uh, step one is, as I mentioned, understanding the threat landscape, understanding, and this is provided by ICE, the Identity Services Engine that Steve touched on, we discover the assets in our environment. That is the bottom rightmost panel. This is a screenshot coming out of Q Compliance. Bits have been uh, cropped out. Top right corner, you see a subset. These are the authorized assets. Inversely, and more importantly, we can now see the assets that are not authorized. Obviously, that's important because they may be malicious actors. So we understand our landscape, we understand the hosts that are out there. It's probably a good idea to start monitoring them, right? So here we have StealthWatch monitoring the assets and the network for threats, malicious activity, incidents, so forth and so on. That directly integrates into ICE for real-time response to anomalous activity. And we're going to be showing you some slides on that here shortly as well. And what you're seeing here in this slide, it might be a little difficult seeing, but Cumulus Q Compliance is displaying all the discovered incidents that are being reported. And that's the bottom most panel. In addition, the top right most panel, you can also start seeing the trend, right? Are my threats increasing or decreasing? Because obviously if it's increasing, you want to take action. Now we're trying to help you go from reactive to proactive. Moving on, this marries well with information system monitoring, right? In order to address this control, we have StealthWatch. And it is satisfying the system's monitoring control to monitor for incidents and attacks. And in the screenshot, you can see individual indicators. There's spark lines showing the the trend. In addition, Southwatch has anomaly detection capabilities. That satisfies SIO4, 11, information system monitoring. So here, down below, on the bottom most panel, we can now see events coming out of the network. You can also then Take that, and if you look at the topmost two panels, you can see those events over time where it's spiking. Now, what do we do with that? We're monitoring, right? Next logical step is alerting. So now we're alerting on the assets that we've identified. We're calling out the malicious actors. We're getting events out of the network. And what you're looking at now are the alerts that are notifying the system owners of 
of the, the various uh, triggered alerts. And what you're seeing here is this system's actions dashboard. Top left most corner is where I'd suggest you look. You can see the various triggered alerts. So uh, why is this important? Because the system's actions dashboard supports the NIST concept of ongoing assessments, where they define event-driven and time-driven activities to maintain your security posture. And this is really where you see any uh, event that would impact your compliance or security posture. So I've gone ahead and highlighted a few controls. Now, this particular client focused on the NIST framework, and I said earlier that we support any framework. What we see here is IRO6, right? It's red. Why is it red? Well, we found that there are hosts that are infected. They have malware on them. What do we do? Well, let's have the system do the heavy lifting for us, right? We're going to have an adaptive response, or if you uh, have been attending the keynotes, maybe you're prescribing to Phantom, can kick off a run book, to then trigger ICE to quarantine that discovered incident. So what you see here on the right-hand side, we drill into ACO3. You can see the raw events, the hosts, or hosts, you can get it however granular, granular you want, have been quarantined. And that's why we see that ACO3 is green. And that means we're happy. Green is good. And this helps us drive that continuous monitoring chain in action, right? So final thing that I would like to go ahead and uh, kind of hammer in again is that we're able to take all that amazing information and then trigger uh, automations off of it. So just a quick time check. We're about 38, 39 minutes in. Got a little bit of time for Q&A later. But before we do that, let's refresh in case you miss a couple things. We want to talk um, about enabling your mission through the automated alignment with the NISC risk management framework. And I mentioned from the get-go that this could apply to any framework, right? And we've gone about and shown that through why you would do it, how you would do it, and then we provide an example of how it was applied. First and foremost, legacy security and compliance is dead. Let's see, if, why is that? It's because, as we talked before about the threat, that rapidly evolving threat is dynamic and it's going to continuously evolve. So unless you are dealing with something in real time that can then adapt to the controls that you have in place that you're looking for that include continuous monitoring, then you will fundamentally not be as successful as if you're able to adopt something that can flex. So how would we do that? Well, first and foremost, security and compliance must be real time. And that's a huge differentiator between legacy compliance and the way it was previously done and the way we propose that you do moving forward. Leveraging real time data and harnessing Splunk, you can now flex or scale with Splunk to ingest petabytes worth of information. In addition, a game changer is continuous monitoring. You can monitor your, uh, the data coming out of your network. And that's something that you previously couldn't do with relational databases, right? So that's, that's critical. Automation, we touched on automation. That is paramount, right? Being able to do things like pass or fail a control or trigger an adaptive response to then maybe block a port or a host on a firewall. One of the most important things that we've seen, though, is we're on a cultural journey here. We've talked about technology a lot. We've talked about some process. But this is a cultural journey in terms of how we're changing and evolving and morphing this capability. And I've been around a long time, and I've seen lots of cultural journeys. And most organizations within the federal government in particular fail if they don't address that from that standpoint. And when you take a look at this, you're talking about people talking to security people. 
And the number of times in the last three months that I can say for the first time that happened, and some of it was fostered by continuous diagnostics mitigation, the CDM program, and some of the time was fostered a number of different things, but you need to have both of them working together because integrated network security is not bolting something on from a security product onto the network. It is integrated. It's designed from the ground up. That's the Cisco view. That is the zero trust view. You've got to look at it and how do you integrate then the capabilities all the way down to layer two to be able to enable success. The other thing is, is that you've got to earn trust. That trust component is the biggest challenge within that cultural journey. And something like Q compliance, Q audit, gives you that safety blanket that says to your leadership, to your colleagues, look, this is the proof that we are doing what we said we were going to do. And whether that is seeing every packet on the network to ensure that there was no malware, or whether that is assuring that the network is doing what it was told as we bring new technologies along in terms of automation on the network, it is foundational because we as humans unfortunately tend to doubt others. And that trust, that security blanket is essential which is why when we were going forward to our clients in this real world example, we made sure that Cumulus was part of the overall solution so they could see the proof and gave them confidence in that step moving forward. And that's why it takes a team to be able to do this. Rucker said it twice, I'll reemphasize it here as we wrap. It's not one company, it's multiple companies. A lot of it is vested on what have you already got in your environment? Because your sunk costs are gonna drive a lot of where you are on the maturity level and a lot of how you integrate. And going forward, it's about integration. It's about open compliance and standards. And yes, I'm from Cisco, and I'm saying Cisco is open with industry standards moving forward, okay? Let it be heard loud and clear. And at the end of the day, that is what is necessary and is what we have embraced, and that is what is essential, we believe, for our client success and your success in the room. And that's really well said, Steve. Finally, and th this is something that Steve hammered in. A framework is not a compliance checklist. So being able to now leverage Splunk to understand your security posture and compliance posture all through a single pane of glass is available to you. We've talked about the why and the how. So you have the tools and the means. The future is now. Thank you very, very much for attending. Again, my name's Rutger. I'm Big Steve. <laughs> and we, thank you. We encourage you all to come by our booths downstairs. I know that we're about to be kicked out, <laughs> but um, if you have a few minutes, we'd love to have you deep dive into a live environment downstairs in the pavilion at the Dolphin, not here, at the, at the Dolphin. And uh, we can walk through all the nitty gritty details. We'd be more than happy to address any questions that you may have. Please go ahead and rate us in the Conf app. Stephen, last. Thank you again. We comments. appreciate your attendance. Thank you.